All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Wayne Mullins, who is in lovely Louisiana. How are you doing, Wayne? I'm doing well, John. How are you today? Great. And Wayne is the founder of the delightfully titled Ugly Mug Marketing. Yeah. <laughs> and what we're going to talk about today is, and I'm very fascinated to hear that as marketing is on my other job, the pipeline is in my bedroom as well. So, uh, Wayne, we're going to talk today about what's not working with marketing. Okay, mm. so let's let's just baseline it. Why do you think uh, that? Why do you think things aren't working with marketing? What are what are some of the um, mistakes or where people are going astray? Yeah, John, I, I would start out by saying that, first of all, I think most people don't really understand the difference between marketing and advertising. And so by default, people assume they're one and the same. And the reality is that advertising is just one piece or one component of your marketing. And so for people to be effective at marketing, they first have to understand what is this thing called marketing? What actually in, encompasses marketing. So they're not one in the same, they're not one in the same. In other words, they're not interchangeable. Yeah. And I think that's a, I, I think that's a great uh, point to, to make, to begin with, because I think, I think that happens also when a lot of people get into marketing or want to be in marketing, because as you say, they confuse it with advertising and they think it's going to be, oh, it's going to be doing all this cool stuff and it's going to be all artistic and creative and it's going to be wonderful. And they don't realize that the bulk of marketing is really, really hard grind. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I've heard uh, a definition of marketing before that it's a mixture of psychology and math mixed together. And, and there's so much true to that because at the end of the day, when you market effectively, what matters are the numbers. The numbers matter. And specifically, the numbers that ring the cash register, right? So at the mm -hmm. end of the day, marketing should lead to sales. It should lead to people pulling out their wallets and handing you money in exchange for whatever it is you offer value. So that is, uh, that is a fundamental piece where most people, when they think marketing, they don't want to think about the numbers that are involved. They instead, like you said, want to think about the cool, creative, the latest social media, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And I think and, and part of the problem is obviously and is that uh, marketing is traditionally not had really good metrics and hasn't been measured by very good metrics or the metrics that they've been measured by have been kind of contained within their department. But as you say, not really attached to outcomes. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that we like to talk about is, you know, it's very easy to develop a checklist and, and mm. kind of take this checklist approach to marketing. Now, there's nothing wrong with checklists. You should have checklists to ensure you're not missing steps, et cetera. But when your mentality shifts to completing items on a checklist as marketing, what happens is you forget the most important thing. The most important thing are those results. It doesn't matter. You can check off a thousand things on a checklist, but if those thousand things don't increase sales, don't increase revenue, don't increase profitability, you've just wasted your time checking off a bunch of things that make you look like you're busy, you're doing important stuff. When in reality, it's not driving sales, it's not driving revenue. So it's, in essence, it's wasted activity. Yeah, and that's where obviously the inherent conflict comes in between you know sales and marketing. So when when you when you work with organizations or when you advise people, how do, and where do you advise them to start when they're looking at what they're doing today with marketing and how they might evolve it to something that's more effective? Yeah, absolutely. It, at the end of the day, marketing really is simple and it overlaps so much with sales. And so, you know, if you think of a traditional sales funnel, um, there's three elements that are required to move somebody from out here in the marketplace as what we would call strangers to the point of pulling out their wallet and handing you money in exchange for whatever it is that you offer. And those three elements are simply, first of all, they have to know about you, obviously. If they don't know about you, you know, there's no transaction. The next mm -hmm. step is they have to like you, right? So they have to like your product, your service, you as a person, what you stand for, what your company stands for. If they don't know about you, they don't like you, then the next element will never happen, which is trust. And if they don't trust you, they don't believe that your product's going to do what it says it's going to do, they're never going to pull up that wallet. And so where we begin with people is simply this, that 
everything in marketing centers around those three things, right? And what we know to be true is when most entrepreneurs, most small business people, most salespeople approach marketing, what they attempt to do is they put too much pressure on one ad or one campaign, and they mm -hmm. want that one ad or that one campaign to accomplish all three of those things, know, like, and trust. And so we step back and we say, no, let's, let's break these into individual pieces. What are we doing, first of all, to get people to know about you, to know what you stand for, to know what your brand is? Then how can we convince them to like you? And then finally, how do we get them to trust you? Yeah, and, and that's interesting because what you've outlined there is, and, and I totally agree with you, is you often hear we, on the flip side is, you know, sales will say, what campaign are we doing right now? What campaign are we doing? Um, as if, as you said, as if it's magically going to, uh, you know, it's create uh, some, some great momentum. But what you've outlined is, you know, no like and trust. These are things that happen over time. And there's a multitude of different activities that have to go into achieving that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's where we say, identify what are the things that you specifically can do just to get people to know about you. Next, what are the things that you can do to get them to like you? And then finally, how can you convince them? What methods, what forms of communication, what media can you use to build trust with those people who already know about you and already like you? And, you know, what I would say is that, you know, in today's society, uh, particularly in the U.S., that mm -hmm. we live in a very skeptical society, right? And so people, the saying that we often say is people would rather trust strangers they've never met than to trust you or me as a marketer, as a salesperson. And, you know, evidence is, think about Amazon. The last mm -hmm. time you purchased anything on Amazon, it doesn't matter if it was a tube of toothpaste, chances are you scrolled down and you looked at what? The reviews, mm -hmm. right? You're trusting all these strangers <laughs> to give you advice, to give you input. And to be honest with you, all these people, A, they could have been paid to do this, yep. B, they could all be crazy, right? And yet we're trusting these strangers over the company that spent tens of millions of dollars developing, you know, this tube of toothpaste or whatever it may be. Yeah, and that, and that just raises, I mean, that raises a, a number of very interesting points, right? So as, as you say is, so people don't inherently trust brands. They don't inherently trust companies. Um, so somehow you have to bring do you have to bring that human factor into it somewhere where they can make some connection with you? Because you're correct. I mean, you can go to Amazon now and I mean, you can, you can see something and it's got, wow, it's got a lot of five-star reviews. And then you see they're all posted within like a day or two of each other and you're going, okay, that doesn't look right. So, right. I mean, unfortunately, you can't even trust that uh, right. to a great extent. So what are some of the first things you can do as a company to start to bridge that gap between seeming like, okay, you're just another company with another brand message as opposed to somebody who maybe can connect with, with your buyer on, on a more kind of maybe on a more intimate level? Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that you can look at is really identifying, you know, what is it that your product, your service, your brand stands for? Mm -hmm. And then what is it that your brand stands against? So, you know, if you think of like action hero movies today, there's always things that the hero stands for, and there's always enemies or causes, things they stand against. And so by nature, we as humans, we kind of associate, and Seth Godin, you know, kind of pioneered this mm -hmm. with his book, Tribes, we kind of associate with tribes or with communities. And so when you clearly articulate as a brand, as a company, regardless of size, and when we start talking about this, oftentimes people tune out and they think, well, that's for the big companies, that's for you know the Fortune 500 or whatever it yeah. may be. But the reality is the small companies that are winning and succeeding today have clearly articulated to the public what they stand for and what they stand against Therefore, it allows people to assemble tribes and communities around these causes. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And obviously, then, uh, if you go back to your know, like, and trust, I mean, the no part is when you, when you interact with the company, and it could be large, it could be really small or whatever, but when you have, that, when you have the experience that you're just describing, the first thing you want to do is share that, right? You want to share that experience with other people. 
Absolutely. And what we call that, we call those evangelists, people Mm -hmm. willing to go out and share with their friends what it is about your product or service. And here's the, here's the interesting thing as salespeople, as marketers, when we think of our jobs, our job is to get people to the point of transaction is what we think, but that's so short sighted because if we instead thought about it in, in the perspective of my job is not just to get people to the point of transaction. My job is to convince them, to give them the tools, the resources that they need to be an evangelist for me, for our product, for our service, for our company. That is where the true power comes in, in today's society. And the one core element that is required to turn somebody from just an average customer into an evangelist is they have to love what it is that you do. Mm -hmm. Now, there's companies that sell, for example, sandwiches. So there's Zingerman's Delicatessen, Ann Arbor, Michigan. They sell sandwiches, deli food, but they exceed their customers' expectations in such a way that customers love it. And those customers who love it, what do they do? They share it on social media. Can you believe this sandwich? You know, they're taking pictures of it. And so mm-hmm. as marketers, as salespeople, we need to step back in it and identify what are the realistic expectations that people have when they purchase our product, our service, our goods? And then what can we do to ensure that we are over delivering? We're exceeding those expectations. And then the final step is, are there some simple tools that we can give them to help them go out and share our message with the world? Yeah, and I think there's, there's a, there was a lot in what you just said there. Um, but I think the, the, the first point is obviously is, as you said, is, is creating an experience that people find unusual. And the sad thing is, Wayne, as you probably agree, that the sad thing is in, in technology or whatever sales is that the, the general experience that people have are not that great. So if you raise it a little bit, you can stand out. It's not like you have, it's not like, you know, this is unachievable or something that could take a long time. If you just step up things a little bit, you can stand out pretty much immediately because as you said, people are skeptical. People are used to having pretty poor experiences in a lot of areas. So anything you do to step up that experience is going to help you stand out immediately. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, John. That That's exactly right. And instead of thinking about or trying to jump on the next bandwagon of the, mm-hmm. you know, the next social media platform or, or whatever it is, instead, step back and do just what you said. Identify what is it in my space that people reasonably expect when they buy our product or service or buy mm-hmm. this product or service in the marketplace? And then what are some simple things that we can do to exceed those expectations? It doesn't have to be crazy. It doesn't have to be expensive. It simply has to be unexpected. And those things go a long, long way, like you said. Yeah, no, and, and absolutely. And and I think the other important part is, again, this isn't just a, this just doesn't belong to marketing, right? Because if we're talking about the experience or experience you have, whether it's with your sandwich shop or whether it's with the technology company, whatever, it's if one part of your experience, your interaction breaks down, it tends to color the whole experience. So everybody has to be on board. Yeah, we we like to say that, you know, there's two questions that every single person in your organization should answer every single day. And those two questions are simply this, what have I done to attract a customer today? And then the second question is, what have I done to keep a customer today? And so from the top of the company to the very bottom, the newest person who just started today, they need to answer those questions. And as leaders, um, it's our responsibility to hold people accountable for those two questions. Because like you said, it, it could be the first person that answers the phone. It could be the first person that greets someone when they walk in the door. Everyone today is in the marketing and sales department, like it or not. It's the, it's the yeah. world we live in. <laughs> No, it it is, and and like I said, it's unfortunate that uh, the reality is that if one part breaks down, as you say, the rest. It's like because I always like to use the analogy of of flying. Right? I mean, you can get to the airport quickly. You can have a great check in experience. Plane can leave on time. Service can be great. Everything can be smooth, and then your bags are delayed coming off, and there's no information given to you as to why. Suddenly, all those great experiences are wiped out. And and when somebody asks yeah. you how was your trip, you tell them it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And we live in a world where every single consumer today is basically 
like a journalist. I mean, with a smartphone in their hand, they can broadcast to the world what they think and what they feel in real time about us, our products and services. So (laughs) never before has in, you know, the history of, of, you know, the human race has the individual had such power to broadcast messages to the entire world about what they're thinking, what they're feeling and the experiences that we are contributing or are helping create for them. Yeah. And I think it gets back as well, way into the beginning of what you were saying about, you know, what do we stand for and what do we stand against? And I think that I think that's a critical piece because um, some people listening to this may say, OK, this all sounds good, but I'm not sure how this would work in my company because I'm not really sure what our message really is. I know what our overall like marketing message is. I know what's in our collateral, but I don't really know what it is that makes us different. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And that that's that because as you know, business owners, as marketers, as entrepreneurs, salespeople, that work is not fun work, right? Sitting mm. down and identifying and really exploring what is it that makes us different? What is it that we do stand for? What is it that we stand against? Um, that work is hard work. It's not fun work. And so instead, we would rather kind of trick ourselves by going out on social media and networking, quote unquote, or making additional posts and doing all these things that make us feel like we're mm. making progress and we're building momentum. When instead, if we were to step back and instead focus on those fundamental things, that has all the impact. And it's a foundational piece that everything is stacked on top of. It makes every other effort that much easier going forward. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's a, that's a great place to, to wrap up today with, uh, with Wayne. Listen, Wayne, this has been really interesting. And I think some great takeaways for people. Um, all of Wayne's information, company information will be in his bio. But before we go, Wayne, could you want to tell people just a little bit more about you and about your delightfully titled Ugly Mug Marketing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, Ugly Mug Marketing, we're now in our 11th year in business. And over those 11 years, we've had the privilege of working with some really, really successful, well-named uh, people that you know I can name drop and people would recognize their names. But um, the reason we've been able to do that is simply this. We don't believe in just checking checklist off. You know, we don't believe in just saying, you know, here's the 400 things we did for you this month. Instead, we understand that at the end of the day, that marketing and sales is about one thing, and that's putting money in the cash register. And when we stay focused on that, and when we stay focused on delivering results for our clients, everything else takes care of itself. So um, just one quick side story on the name, Ugly Mug Marketing, comes from, uh, you may know the name David Ogilvy. So David Ogilvy Mm -hmm. came over to America, I believe late 50s, early 60s. And uh, he was a marketer by trade. He landed in New York City with $40 in his pocket as the rumor has it. And he basically said, from right here, I'm going to build the world's largest ad agency. And within 15 years, that's exactly what he had done. Ogilvy and Mather for a long time was the largest in the world. They're still in the top 10. And he had a saying that was, I would rather an ad that is ugly, that gets results than one that's beautiful, that doesn't. And so that is where the name ugly mug marketing comes from, that we want to stay focused on the ugly things possibly that get results instead of being diluted by or distracted by the things that are quote unquote beautiful. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think that's a great story and I think that's a great philosophy because it is a trap that people fall into. I've, I've experienced it myself sometimes when, uh, you know, you've gotten pushback from designers or marketing people who say, you know, oh, that, that just doesn't fit <laughs> with the, the look and everything. But then it actually it actually converts it, yeah. and it's it converts because it's obvious and ugly in your face. And um, in a world where there's lacking, you know, people have small attention spans. Sometimes that's the best thing you can do. Absolutely. All right. Listen, thanks, Wayne. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.